Casanova's first view of Catherine the Great was at a magnificent masked ball in the Venetian style held at the Winter Palace within hours of his arrival in St. Petersburg. He became aware of a whisper that the Tsarina was in the room, masked and in costume, with her lover Grigory Orlov. I hear more than a hundred maskers say the same thing as she passes, all of them pretending not to recognize her. The Empress had deliberately worn a simple costume and was eavesdropping on what she chose to believe was uncensored comment on her governance. Of course, it was a charade. No one failed to recognize her. She was described by Casanova as not beautiful, but whoever examined her had reason to be pleased, finding her tall, well-built, gentle. Catherine's was a glittering court, outshining all other courts in Europe, and the Winter Palace Ball was the perfect introduction to St. Petersburg in that it promised Casanova adventure and intrigue. Catherine was at the head of one of the most repressive states in Europe, yet chose to inveigle foreigners in her affairs to promulgate abroad an idea of an enlightened new Russia. Casanova was told that his best chance of gaining an introduction to the Tsarina would be to skulk among the Italian statues in the Grotto of the Summer Gardens. One clement morning, Casanova saw the royal entourage approaching. Catherine engaged him in small talk about Russia, and when the Empress mentioned that she had not seen him at her regular musical soirees, Casanova remembered that she was well known to be bored by music. Explaining his absence from her musical evenings, he shared with the Empress his regret that he found little pleasure in concerts. She smiled. Thereafter, Casanova went every morning to the gardens, in the hope of seeing her again. On the second occasion he saw her, Catherine signalled to one of her soldiers to bring him over. They talked about Venice, which led to a conversation about the differences between the Russian and Venetian calendars. Casanova pounced. He had a great deal of background in astrology and date work. He reminded Catherine that Peter the Great had intended adopting the Gregorian rather than the Julian calendar when the Russians had abandoned the Eastern Orthodox calendar. Catherine ended the conversation with the intention of continuing it when she had had the opportunity to brief herself in detail. She was clearly contemplating taking Casanova's advice, but in the end she let go this item of modernity for fear of a religious backlash. Casanova's dream of finding himself pensioned off as a calendar maker to the Russian court was not to be. Anxious not to suffer another Russian winter, Casanova decided to try his luck in Poland. Casanova made fast progress into the Polish court and theatre. In March 1766, he was invited to attend the theatre to witness the two great divas of the Warsaw Ballet. They were both, of course, known to Casanova as they were Italian, and one, Anna Binetti, may have shared his bed in London. Now she had a Polish lover, Count Xavier Branitsky, her protector. After the performance, Casanova went to pay his respects to both dancers, only to find Binetti fuming that she had not been visited first. She set Branitsky to pick a quarrel with her old Venetian friend, he accused Casanova of being a coward, which only provoked Casanova to retort that the term was rather strong. When he turned away, Branitsky called him publicly a Venetian poltroon. This was too much for Casanova. He told the aristocrat that a Venetian poltroon was quite capable of killing a Pole. My lord, at the theatre you gravely insulted me, having neither the right nor justification to behave so. That being so, I can and will satisfy you. Thus Casanova challenged Branitsky to a duel. Branitsky wanted to fight with pistols. The two men then met at the appointed hour and were both wounded. Branitsky was shrapnel in his stomach, from which, surprisingly, he recovered, and Casanova in the skin of the left arm. The duel, which had broken Warsaw's strict anti-dueling laws, was a watershed for Casanova. It brought him both applause and notoriety, and a new, not altogether welcome fame as a volatile presence in any city. 
It soon became clear that he would not be able to persuade King Stanislas to support a lottery any more than he had Frederick the Great or Catherine. Neapolitan society had always been good to Casanova, and rarely more so than in the summer of 1770. Half the population of every salon he attended seemed to have encountered him elsewhere in Europe. But after the last of Casanova's fortune was dissipated in the city, he started planning to go north to Rome. Not, however, before he had visited his beloved Anna Maria and their daughter Leonilda. In the years since he had last seen them and made play for Leonilda before he knew she was his daughter, Leonilda had prospered. She had married a Marchesa, and she and her mother lived in some style at a large country estate. Leonilda was now twenty, and with a man who was all but impotent. The old Marchesa was gout-ridden, unable to stand when his young wife introduced him. Leonilda, Casanova noted, had lost none of her girlish impetuousness. She ran into Casanova's arms. Casanova and Anna Maria reaffirmed their friendship and discussed their concern for their daughter. Though Leonilda had married well, Anna Maria feared that their daughter was unhappy. She wanted a child. They walked in the gardens, mother, daughter, and Casanova. All three seemed to have been complicit in what happened next. As soon as we were alone, we surrendered to the pleasures of calling each other father and daughter, which gave us the right to pleasures which, though imperfect, were sinful nonetheless. It is one of the more astonishing episodes in his memoirs, an almost unique confession of incest, but with a specific contextual background. Leonilda's need for a child, Anna Maria's interest in finding her a discreet lover, the lack of seriousness attached to incest in some church circles, and the lack of privacy in family life. But what began as shocking became farcical. Appetite, as Casanova pointed out, grows with eating, and he found himself keeping Anna Maria's maid, Anastasia, happy at night and meeting Leonilda only two or three more times in the garden. Naturally, it could not last. The old Marchese was now aware that Casanova was Leonilda's father. It was his cue to leave. He travelled to Rome in the blistering heat of September 1770. A few weeks later, Leonilda discovered she was pregnant. The coffee houses of the Condotti, the oyster taverns of the Spanish steppes, and the beds of girls young enough to be his daughter became Casanova's Rome. Then, in September 1774, a letter arrived with the lion seals of Venice upon it. Nearly nineteen years after his escape from the Leds prison, Casanova was granted pardon and permission to return to Venice. His reception in Venice, his native country, was warm. The happiest day of my life, he said. Casanova still had friends in high places. He took a small house near San Marco and set to writing a modern translation of the Iliad. But worthy classical literature was not the vogue any more in Venice. Pragmatist to the last, he accepted a post working clandestinely for the Inquisition. He was being asked to turn gamekeeper, but it afforded him with a regular income. In the summer of 1779, he met a seamstress, Francesca Buschini, and they lived together for several years as a respectable Venetian couple. By his standards, life was sedate and bourgeois, and Casanova was becoming cantankerous, he felt Venice and the wider world of French literature owed him recognition, although the majority of his work was still unpublished. I am fifty-eight years old. Winter approaches. And if I think of becoming again an adventurer on the road, I begin to laugh at myself. But in 1783, after another dispute over money, he took his leave of Francesca. He would never see her or Venice again. 
from Venice to Trieste to Vienna. In Vienna, sometime in February 1784, Casanova met Count Joseph Charles de Waldstein, the owner of the domain of Dukes in northeast Bohemia. Dukes Castle had a library in want of a librarian, and Casanova accepted Waldstein's appointment as castle librarian at an annual salary of a thousand florins. The rooms Casanova was assigned in the castle opened onto the central square of Dukes, a bleakly provincial town known for long, snowy winters and an atmosphere heavy with the smell of surface-mined coal. Food was the one sensual joy left to Casanova, but there was little pleasure to be found on the table at Dukes. There is a heartfelt note from late in Casanova's life with a recipe for Venetian biscuits. These are the biscuits I long to eat, he wrote, soaked in wine to fortify the stomach, composed of a little flour, an egg yolk, and a lot of sugar. One advantage, however, of Dukes from Casanova's point of view was its proximity to Teplitzer, then an epicenter for pleasure-seekers and curistes. There Casanova befriended Prince Charles-Joseph de Ligne. The revolution and the horror of the terror had appalled them both. Many of Casanova's friends and former lovers had gone to the guillotine. Theirs was a breezy, loving friendship. Put on your wig, mon cher Casanova. You are never old, not with your heart, your genius, and your stomach. It was to Delinia that Casanova first showed some early drafts of his memoirs. Delinia said he could not read a single chapter without envy, amusement, astonishment, or arousal. Yet Delinia left a sad portrait of his friend at Dux. A day did not go by that he did not have a quarrel. Over his coffee, his plate of macaroni, he gesticulated while reciting his Italian poems. People laughed. He had dressed up with his old suit of gold embroidered silk. And people had laughed. These were the years of Casanova's manic scribbling. Depression stalked him, as his world narrowed to his rooms above the castle courtyard. He spent hours in the hope of winning an economics prize and in convincing governments of his prowess with lottery management. He thought of writing again on Voltaire, on Russia. Casanova survived past his 73rd birthday, his large frame slowly withering, relying on soup in which he had always had faith. The death of the old librarian on the 4th of June, 1798, came unexpectedly in the chateau. He was sitting in his armchair, a winged salon throne of a type fashionable earlier in the century, and there he died in the bright afternoon sunlight. The old Venetian's unpublished memoirs, nearly 4,000 folio pages, lay beside him. <laughs>